Moments ago, stage four of the Larry H. Miller Tour of Utah underway. Eight laps over the Salt Lake City circuit, and we'll have all the live racing next. Utah's capital city of Salt Lake on an August late afternoon. Site of today's fourth stage of the 2019 Larry H. Miller Tour of Utah. Today's stage presented by America First Credit Union. Whatever your individual financial goals, America First has the products, tools, and services to help you go the distance. And the distance today is going to be eight circuits around this Salt Lake City area. And it is a stage we've seen before, Todd. It is one of those that uh, it is not a sprint stage, but it could end up being a drag race at the finish. But there are some climbs that they will have to be concerned about. Yeah, tricky, very dynamic circuit here. They'll do it eight times. There's a climb right up State Street and then around the Capitol. And that's where the start finish line is. And we see a lot of stretching out of the group, coming back together. And in the years past, the breakaway has not been able to stay away. Well, let's talk about breakaways not staying away as we go back to yesterday because the winning ride of Ben Hermans, who for the second day in a row won the stage and maintains the yellow jersey with about 500 meters left in the climb. In yesterday's North Salt Lake stage, he just overhauls everybody and no one can go with it. Flies by Murphy, who had just a small advantage. And that's Lawson Craddock, last man standing from the break. Looks over, cannot answer. Nobody had the legs to match the Belgian rider on the Israel Cycling Academy team. He made it two in a row. Certainly feeling it. Hangs on to the yellow jersey coming into today's stage and looks very comfortable as we look at the top five in the GC now. Hermans with the J, the, uh, the jersey and Piccoli second, 44 seconds behind. And then you've got Eck, Murphy, and Stetton rounding out the top five. And notice the gaps are starting to get a little bit bigger. And we're up to two minutes down by we're in sixth place. Former overall champion Dombrowski, Almeida there at 238. Britain, a former winner at 312. Craddock. Former yellow jersey earlier this week and Badalati at 344. So the gap's starting to open up. That brings us to today. The start will be right in front of the state capitol building and they will make the eight loops. They'll go up City Creek Canyon and then along the bench and then turning down west. And boy, does this one pick up some speed as they came down Virginia. They'll make the loop. They'll go right back up again up State Street after coming off South Temple. And this is the grind, the climb. Yeah, tough circuit. We always see lots of action, but usually right at the end, the break is caught, and then it's just who has the legs to whip it up the final time. And some movement already at the front of the peloton in an 88 degree afternoon here with 16% humidity. The wind, a little bit of a breeze, north, northwest nine, but the forecast is for sunny. We'll cool off a little bit, but it is a warm evening. And believe it or not, this is what passes as a dry cold front in August in Utah. It uh, has taken the temperature down about six or seven degrees from what we've experienced the last couple of days. And these are the uh, the riders out front right now as the peloton starting to maybe create a little bit of separation, but there's a long way to go. And the question is who, if anybody, can get out and stay out here? Yeah, people just trying to get established in that early break. Lots of action here over the last several minutes, but just continually reshuffling. Groups of three or four get away. They get brought back by the tele Peloton. Others attack. And look at the single file line. They are flying through Salt Lake City. When this tour began on Monday with the prologue at Snowbird, there were 113 riders in the field. In the ensuing days, we have lost 11 of them either to injury or not making the time differences uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, the time cut. And so you've got to make it within a certain percentage of the winning time. Yesterday, uh, well, throughout the week, they've had 15%, they've had 10%, 12%, and I believe it's 8% if I'm not mistaken today, but they have got to change and make it within a certain time so they don't get dropped off the back. 
today. Well, hopefully things will be congested and we won't drop anybody else, but only 11 out of the uh, out of the five days of racing or four days previous. Yeah, today is an 8% time cut. They extended the time cut yesterday to make it 15% just because of the hot temperatures today. The riders won't get that opportunity to have extra time if they are dropped and there's a good look at the field and notice how much motion there is. Riders coming up the right side and they try to get into position. Riders going up the left side and then they get in front and then the people in the front kind of get flushed back through the middle. So when you're in the middle, you're, you tend to be going backwards. When you're on the outsides, you're going forwards, but you're in the wind. If you'll notice the shadows, there are some shadows beginning to appear now. And when they make that turn to climb up to the Capitol, the sun will be going down on their left. There will be some shade. There will be some shade, not much. And especially going down South Temple there, it's a pretty wide open sun exposure that they will uh, that they will anticipate. So it's going to be hot. There's no two ways about it. And now they're heading directly towards the west and that sun that will be setting. You can see the shadows behind them now. Keep an eye on that because obviously the weather has been a factor throughout the week. A lot of the riders say they enjoy the warmth because it is a dry heat. It's still heat. It's <laughs> dry, a lot. Of, yeah. Dry or not. It's a lot of heat. It's hard to stay hydrated throughout the seven days of this race. But everybody knows when they come here that every year the temperatures are very hot and you just got to really work on your hydration day after day. And it looks like Lawson Craddock going to the front of the peloton. He's in the sprint jersey and uh, he's just trying to maybe contain that breakaway a little bit and also be in a position for the climb. He had one teammate on his wheel. As that that corner a little bit narrow and it sets him straight up into the bottom of the climb. So you want to be in good position. This breakaway looks like it might have a chance to get itself established this second time around. Right now it's still you know a little bit of touch and go for them. We'll see if they maintain this gap and stretch it out or if there's another reshuffle. Quick check back there and see what the gap is right now on the peloton. This is the first of the eight circuits. This stage has been run in various different lengths and incarnations over the years of the Tour of Utah. One year it was a 10 circuit race. It's been as small as a five circuit race and today they'll go eight. Well in the break uh, just working to see everybody in there. It looks like it's uh, about eight riders in that break. We've got Mosca for Trek Segafredo. Also in there are Sergei Kvetkov, a man who has seen good success in Utah. He's a worthy pro cycling rider in there on the left side of your screen, midway back. Uh, Ulysses Castillo in there for Elevate KHS. Also, we've got uh, Alex Hohen, second in the best young rider category in there for Evolo, his teammate. Connor Schunk in there as well. And three more men in the move, Stephen Bessett and uh, also Ben Wolf, and the final man is Tony Baca for the 303 project out of Colorado. And this is where they will finish the race, so we'll bring them under the finish banner for the first time. They have seven left, and we'll continue with racing here. Stage four, you're live, a Larry H. Miller Tour of Utah. Here they head for the finish. Crowd up above. Good crowd. Easy uh, venue here from downtown Salt Lake and an opportunity for people to uh, maybe delay their exit for work, leaving the city tonight and uh, coming to watch racing. Always a great atmosphere here in Salt Lake City and you can see how close the field is behind the break. And look at the front of the field. It's actually split up significantly. There's gaps right here. This is maybe half the field and then a group behind them. So it is on right now. They are not easing into the eight circuits in Salt Lake City, that's for sure. Huge crowds as well. That first lap, a little over 14 minutes, almost 14 and a half. It's one of eight. We'll be back. The 2019 Larry H. Miller Tour of Utah is brought to you by the Larry H. Miller Group of Companies. More than 80 businesses united by one simple mission of enriching lives. Zions Bank, a banking built to keep up with life. Zions Bank is for you. University of Utah Health, 
official medical provider of the Larry H. Miller Tour of Utah and you. Snowbird, proud partner and host venue of the Tour of Utah. And by the Utah Office of Tourism. Experience life-elevating moments in and between Utah's mighty five national parks and on the greatest snow on earth. Live racing, hope you're enjoying today's broadcast in high definition. It's presented by the Utah Sports Commission, the proud partner of the Tour of Utah. What a difference a couple of moments makes because it was a small group minutes ago, and now we've seen the group expand off the top, and that group has swollen to about 10 or 12 riders, and the Peloton trails by about 10 seconds. So you're going to see a lot of help for the folks that are out front in the weather right now. And we're going to take you inside the tour with our man on the moto, Chad Andrews. Chad. Hey, guys. Happy Friday to you. I want to give you a quickly on the gentleman. We think have a great opportunity. First of all, Travis McKay. Talk to him. First question to Travis was, don't you think you should have pulled the plug yet, knowing that today is extra special for you? He goes, you know what? That one for me. He felt that the Peloton was going to disintegrate. It did, but he did spend a lot of energy. I asked him about tonight. He goes, it reminds me back in the day when I was doing Twilight Crits. Rest all day, race for two hours hard. So Travis has to be a favorite. Then Marco Canola found out that he was cramping really bad yesterday on the last backside of the bike race. And finally, let's talk about rally. Kyle Murphy is currently sitting in top five overall. So I asked Baja Dali, I said, what's your play today? He said, well, ideally we're going to race for Magner, ironically enough, but we're also going to keep a keen eye on the overall GC because they want to solidify top three overall. Magner came up to me just before racing. He said, legs feel good. Back to you guys. All right, Chad, thank you very much. Chad's report brought to us by the LHM group of companies. More than 80 businesses uh, united by one simple mission, that's enriching lives. And we'll be checking throughout the evening and throughout the remainder of the tour with our man Chad, who's got one of the best seats in the house, Todd. Boy, he does. But uh, he did say after yesterday's circuit, he was beat up, just hanging on for dear life on the back of that moto on the circuits in North Salt Lake. Now they're on the second lap of the eight circuits that will be coming up. So here's our yellow jersey up at the front of the field. and being tested very early in this Salt Lake City circuit. We've got a powerful break off the front right now with uh, over 10 riders. And things just coming apart, coming back together. So we will see how this shakes out. A lot happening as every, it seems like every time we see the break, it's a different break. So now we're down to looks like six guys and Lawson Craddock in there. We still have Ben Wolf in there. He was in the earlier move. Coming along the eastern bench there, and they'll be heading, of course, for Virginia Street when they make that turn to the west. That's when they'll pick up the speed and they'll come down the hill again. Width of the road is one of the advantages that you have when you run a circuit like this in Salt Lake City because the streets of the state's capitals typically wide, especially when you get to downtown. They were actually created by the uh, by Brigham Young, who, of course, led the colonization of this area wide enough to turn an ox team around in the street. That was the uh, the model for designing the downtown city streets. Now, they've lost some, some width over the years with sidewalks and planters and things of that nature, but typically still wide streets. And I know a lot of these riders have expressed their appreciation to that throughout the tour and throughout the history of the Tour of Utah. Now, occasionally, you get the islands like that. You better be prepared for them. But for the most part, you've got room to maneuver. Yeah, 50-plus miles an hour as they plummet down Virginia Street, and then they make that right turn at the bottom and hang on for that corner. Racing continues here. Stage four of the Larry H. Miller Tour of Utah, the Salt Lake Circuit. Let's go! Yeah, I wouldn't miss it. It's going to be so cool. Ah! It's a life-changing moment for the rest of my life. This is the champion we've been waiting for. And Dwight. Ow! God damn it! Interesting choice of words. It's literally a big deal. My aim is to prove 
kindness can change the world. Still a group of five out front right now. Looks like they have at least established a little bit of a breakaway, but not much as you can see how close the peloton is behind them. Still almost 54 miles to go. And that peloton, well, it's got actually a chase group and then the peloton and then a, a bunch off the back as well. So we've already seen some selection here early on this second circuit yeah, it's of just, eight. It's just been going ballistic here as everybody trying to make something happen. When you're back here, you can see you get bunched up at the bottom, you lose all your speed, and then you have to accelerate. You get this rubber band effect or this yo-yo effect. It's actually a really hard when you're at the back. At the front, you have a clean line and you can carry your speed. Craddock there on the right just being absorbed. So that group of five is no longer off the front once again. Another reset at the front of the bike race. They work their way up. They'll come through the finish line when they make the turn to the east, and that'll be the second time through. They have eight total on the day, 53.8 miles, 4,460 feet of climbing, or an average of 557 and a half per circuit, and it's mostly on that last climb right there when they turn onto State Street. Yeah, we got about 20 riders, maybe 21 riders in this selection here, this separation that has gotten away. The field not far behind. This is a big enough group that if they don't work well together, they could easily end up being sucked up by the field. This is Craddock. I think he might be in between. No, he was out front. Craddock has been a guy who's really put in some aggressive rides so far. Yeah, he's been, uh, he's been going for it quite a bit. Second in the prologue. Second on stage one, that put him in the leader's jersey. He ended up losing that the next day on Powder Mountain, but he has been very active throughout this race. Yeah, he was the last, he was the, uh, the last person passed on the Powder Mountain win by Hermans. And I wonder, if, I wonder if Lawson Craddock thought that was an intermediate sprint lap because he's in the sprinter's jersey. jersey. The next time around is a sprint, so with five to go, uh, three to go and one to go. There are intermediate sprints, and for those, there are five, three, and one points. Maybe he thought that was actually a sprint lap, so he just went to the front just to make sure he got it, but he was one lap early on that. Which shows the importance of communication, and of course, we've seen that several times over the Tour of Utah over the years when riders, um, notably a few years ago, a rider thought that he was finished and he had one more circuit and thought that he had actually won the stage and then realized and was told you have one more left. So very important that your team maintains communication and that you know where you are, especially in multiple circuits. This is the, the front of the group right here. And again, you can see starting to fracture a little bit. We expect it to string out a lot more before this is over with. And there'll certainly be, I believe, there'll be an awful lot more drama before we get to the end of the eight circuits. And when you look at this, it's one of the things you got to keep in mind is every one of these attacks is a really hard effort. And the riders around them, they have to choose. Do I need to go with this tactically? Is this good for myself or my team? Do I need to make this effort? Or do I hold back because I don't think it's going to go anywhere or my teammate is there? And the, so it's like doing sprints in the middle of a marathon, if that makes sense. And you really, the fastest way is to go steady, but to get the separation, you got to attack. In and out of the shadows up City Creek Canyon as the stage continues here. It's the fourth stage of the Larry H. Miller Tour of Utah. It's time for University of Utah Health Tour Insider. And many athletic uh, pursuits as well as cycling, concussions have become an increasingly important uh, element. But within the Tour of Utah, our medical team has between 15 and 30 seconds to diagnose uh, a down rider as having a concussion so the rider can get back up and ride if he's able to rejoin the group. We have a protocol to answer five simple questions. If the rider can answer those questions, the rider is then allowed to return to the race. This is a look at the peloton here as they uh, have a group that's out front of them, but they don't look to be too worried about it right now, although there are some big names in that group that got away. And speaking of one of them, Travis McCabe, who is uh, riding for Worthy and is wearing the fan favorite jersey. That's him, number 75 right now. He is Todd's pick for the day, and he visited with our Kristen Kenny before the stage. 
Now Travis as a sprinter, this is it. This is the last potential stage win for the Tour of Utah for you. So what is your mindset going into this one? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty nervous. You know, this is a hard stage. And this is this is the final sprint stage that we have in Tour of Utah. And it's probably one of the best stages, I think, being in Salt Lake City, going around the capital. It's a really fantastic race. Everyone comes out. Tonight's going to be, you know, it's a bit different because now it's in the evening, whereas before we had it midday. So I don't think the heat's going to be as much of a factor. But, yeah, I'm coming into it, going for that win. I mean, I was hoping to get something out of the breakaway yesterday. Unfortunately, that didn't play out. It's just bike racing. And um, today's another day, so legs feel good, motivated, the team's all behind me, and so hopefully I can uh, secure another victory. Well, we talked before about the last year's race here and the dramatic finish. I know you said that made it extra special for you to get this one today. Yeah, I mean, losing by like this much, it hurts. It doesn't, doesn't feel good when you lose by that much, but again, it happens. So for me today, it'd be really nice to come back and actually win this one. Uh, it would mean a lot. And then also, you know, we did this two years ago in 2017. That was the last stage, and I was able to secure the sprint victory, or the sprint jersey from that, my first sprint jersey uh, from Tour Utah. And I think today it's going to come down to that as well, too. So if I can get the win, I can get the jersey. So it's just that extra bit of motivation. Uh, the finish is at the top of the hill, but I'm climbing well, and it, everyone's got to go up it. So it suits someone like me a little bit better because I have more of a punch, I think and those false flats, kind of the grind uphill, um, hopefully we'll play in my favor. All right, good luck today, Travis. Thanks, Kristen. And during that interview, he and teammate Sergey Fetkov just left the others behind, so the two worthy riders out in front trying to put a little distance between themselves and the chase. We'll step aside, more racing straight ahead. Travis McCabe out front along with his worthy teammate, Sergei Fetkov. They've pulled ahead of the group, the chase group behind them as they get ready to head for the uh, the first sprint points available today. This is an all team effort here as these two riders going all in out of the breakaway. And it tells me that Travis McCabe is not super confident in being able to out sprint Humberto Marengo, who's also in that chase group behind who's at one point in front of him in the sprint competition. So he's going off early. So Craddock leads that. Marengo sitting in second place, one second back. And then McCabe tied with Hermans for third. So McCabe hitting out early on this circuit, using a lot of energy. But this way, if he can stay in front of the group, he knows he's going to get maximum points when they come up to the finish line. That's five points for the win teammate there. Those are the sprint points. Five available for first. Vetkoff out front and obviously he will defer to McKay but they come up near the top of that sprint. Absolutely and he will also suck up the second place time bonus or the second place sprint bonus. So even if Marengo is the next guy from the chasing group he will only be in third place. Back to the two riders up front. Fetkov, the uh, four or five time national time trial champion. So he's a very good time trialist. He's a great guy to have with you all across the top of the avenues, the plunge down, and then back over west on West Temple to the climb up State Street. Yeah, Vetkov has won the time trials as a Romanian and also as a Moldovan too. So he is um, multi, uh, what, national and, uh, and a multi-time time trial champion. But right now, just sitting off his wheel, there is his teammate, Travis McCabe, who, you know, you heard him talk about. He holds, by the way, the most stage wins in, in Tour of Utah history, does McCabe. He's won, what, four previous stages? That's the most of any other rider. Yeah, yeah, he's won four stages. He's also won two overall sprint classification jerseys. And if he can scoop up some points here, that will get him a long way toward winning his third sprint classification jersey. He'd also like to win this stage. The big points are at the finish line, 15 points for a win, and they go 10 places deep. And there's two riders trying to come across, but it is going to be Svetkov and McCabe for the intermediate sprint. So he'll get maximum points, 300 meters to go. 
And this race has just been out of control today. Yeah, Ventcuff just looking over his shoulder to make sure that he's still right there. And then it's just a question of when McCabe will come around him to take the points for first in the intermediate sprint. Well, now you've got Chase getting up there, though. This is pretty close, Todd. Yeah, we've got uh, one of the Connells riders and well as one of the Evolo riders coming across. That's Efron Santos for Connells as they're just about to make contact here. So McCabe gets maximum points and the next man in that competition, Umberto, gets none. They only go three places deep in the intermediate sprint. So that now puts him in the lead of the sprinters competition. Back to our field, and this is the group in between. This is the group that Svetkov and McCabe came out of. And Chase group listed as 15 seconds behind. I think it's a little closer than that, and the lead group is now four riders. It was two and two, and now they've joined its four riders, and the peloton a minute behind as they're coming up to the top, and then they'll make that swing to the east and go under the start finish banner as well. So five remaining All right, we've the also, lead group. And we've also got Alex Hohen up there for a Volo. He's second in the best young rider classification. He's over five minutes down, so we don't have to uh, think that there's going to be a change in that classification, but great riding by that young man. The 21-year-old, the Peloton, just cresting out the top of the steep part of the climb on State Street. And we also have, it looks like Jimmy Whalen in there for EF Education first. He's made it across from the chasing group up to the four leaders to make it into a group of five. Education first, one of the two world tour teams there, the other being the Trek team. And it's all Israel Cycling Academy on the front. See that? They have their entire team lined up on the front right now. They got Ben Hermans in the yellow jersey. He's the leader of the overall classification. He's sitting in fourth wheel, and then he's got two more teammates behind him. So six riders from that squad on the front trying to settle things down a little bit because this race today, they've been hitting each other from the very beginning. It's far from settled right now. The Peloton a minute 20 behind the five riders in the lead group. And then those 10 riders that are just 15 seconds back. So it's a big gap. Has, yeah, this one has plenty of drama still left in it. It is a big gap. And the racing will continue. There'll be a total of eight circuits before it's over. It is a title worthy of nature's most diverse and elegant playground. Utah, the state of sport. We continue to build on what is now a superior reputation in the national and worldwide sports industry. Utah is a proven leader in the winter, action, adventure, and motorsports arenas, hosting the best of the best, always pushing the limits of human performance like the Nitro World Games, Dew Tour, Red Bull Rampage, Xterra, Supercross, Iron Man, and of course, the Larry H. Miller Tour of Utah. Many thought the 2002 Winter Olympic Games would be the pinnacle of sports in Utah. In retrospect, it's quite clear. The Olympics were just the beginning. Oh, look, here comes the attack, Hermans. Oh, Hermans. Wow. When I saw that the two guys in front, that they were completely uh, exploding, uh, then I knew uh, I can win the race. So Hermans, once again, the wily veteran following Piccoli and going on the attack. No way. Then I knew that uh, at the end of the climb, I could drop him. So Ben Hermans, he will continue to wear yellow and expand the lead. I could make a really big gap actually on the on the top and uh, this surprised me. Ben Hermans, the Belgian, will take stage three. Uh, it's good to have this plan in mind, but it's not uh, so easy to execute. Well, that was yesterday and of course it staked Hermans again to the yellow jersey brought to us by the Larry H. Miller group of companies, Craddock, best sprinter, Alex Howes, the Utah Office of Tourism, King of the Mountain, 
uh, Almeida in the best young rider. The Larry H. Miller dealership's most aggressive rider is Kyle Murphy and Travis McCabe, who's the fan favorite and wears the best sprinter jersey right now. And there is your yellow jersey wear in Ben Herman's. Now, if it were real time, Travis McCabe would definitely be in the sprint jersey because he just picked up the points for the first intermediate sprint. But that's a look at Ben Herman's, the overall leader. Won the last two consecutive stages, so would like to add a third one to it, although tough ask for him today. Yeah, tough, tough ask for the overall race leader today, but he will be thinking probably about the final stage in Park City and over Empire. That day does suit him. He's got his entire team on the front trying to control the break. The break up to uh, roughly 16 riders, if I've got my count correct. A lot of horsepower in there, not really dangerous for the general classification. Sergei Fetkov, the pe best place guy in the break. And uh, I want to say he's like uh, eight minutes and 30 seconds down in the general classification. Well, speaking of break, we're going to take one. We expect a lot more racing before this one is over with. We want to get the uh, commercials in the bank, and then we'll be back. Follow the leaders. The 2019 Larry H. Miller Tour of Utah is brought to you by the Utah Office of Tourism. Experience life-elevating moments in and between Utah's mighty five national parks and on the greatest snow on earth. And by the Larry H. Miller dealerships, proud sponsors of the 2019 Most Aggressive Rider jersey, driven by you. Downtown Salt Lake City and a look at the state capitol building. They're almost halfway home. Began with uh, eight circuits. Next time the league group comes through, there'll be four remaining. Todd, let's talk a little bit about the composition of this breakaway. It looks like it's settled down maybe a little bit more than it had, but still uh, not really a, a super cohesive unit yet, depending on when you catch them on this circuit. Yeah, that's, uh, that's right. We've got so many riders in the front group that it takes a while for them to settle into a rhythm where everybody starts working, but almost every team in the bike race is represented in this front group. I believe three teams are not there, and that would be the Donner Aachen team out of uh, Germany, Bridge Lane out of Australia, and also the Nipovini Fantini team, the Italian squad. They're not represented, but that means there aren't many other teams to chase back in the field. And so this break may actually be able to go the distance. There's a ton of horsepower in here. They're up to a minute and 40 gap. Now they come up State Street again, and this is going back on to South Temple before the Peloton will make that right-hand turn. Speed's coming down, obviously, when they go down uh, Virginia Street. The speeds are significant. Not quite as much elevation change when they come down South Temple, but certainly when they make that turn off the East Bench and head west, that's where the real speeds start to accelerate. Yeah, it's a rip and descent straight. A couple of traffic islands in the middle, but they're all used to those, so there's, there's really no danger posed by those. And that corner at the bottom is absolutely nerve-wracking. They come flying into it so fast. 16 riders still out front. A minute 40 is the gap, the last official gap. So both Howes and Whalen in the front group for EF Education first. Jacobo Mosca for Trek Segafredo is in there. Ty Magner, the sprinter for Rally, is in there. There's a bunch of sprinters in there. Israel Cycling Academy has Avila. He's just sitting on the back. He's not doing any work. Uh, Neri uh, Satoli with Umberto Marengo, who came into the day sitting second in the sprint classification. He has now dropped to third based on the last time around when McCabe got maximum points. It's a big group, a lot of power. Those 16 riders now approaching the finish line up here. And again, getting to where the bulk of this crowd is. It's the it's the downtown crowd that a lot of them have left work a little bit early to get here and have a chance to see some of the top professional cyclists in the world as they participate here in the Tour of Utah. This is the cable cam that uh, was running alongside this group. Give you some idea of the pace that they're setting. It's great. Mosca in the white there, just pulling off the front. Fetkov coming to the front. 
for Worthy, his teammate and sprint leader, Travis McCabe on his wheel, then Ty Magner right behind him, then Waylon in the pink, Santos, the blue sleeves, um, uh, Marengo there out of the saddle in the yellow. Local favorite there is T.J. Eisenhart with his gray shirt, Hope Open, the Hincapie rider. And he's got the uh, now familiar turquoise necklace on as he's got the shirt open and enjoying maybe a little evaporative cooling. He's towards the end of that 16 person yeah. breakaway. Yeah, and I, I think Marengo there a little bit confused. Um, it looked like he made a little bit of an effort thinking there were sprint points there. That's four laps to go. And uh, the, what I'm looking at in the race Bible, five to go, three to go, and one to go. So maybe next time around next then, right? time around. But we saw Craddock do it with six to go. Remember, so it, it's hard to keep track. There's a lot happening. There's a lot of fighting for position and uh, it, it's easy to lose track. Now we talked about uh, the race uh, team communications. Also, when you go through that finish line, if you have the opportunity, you can glance up to not only see the elapsed time on the ride, but also the number of circuits remaining. Yeah, we'll see if we get a look at it as they come through. This is the, being the field, a minute 30 back. So they picked up a little bit of time and uh, we'll, we'll see if the breakaway can continue on. So look at that, almost the entire Nipovini Fantini squad on the front. They've got Fiorelli as a backup sprinter for Conola. Conola crashed pretty hard in the first road stage. He's pretty beat up, he's got some stitches. And they come through, four to go. It's just up in the left side of your screen. We just barely saw that number. As they look up, they will be able to see that. But it's hard when you're racing hard to have that awareness to look up at the truss above the finish line. Riders coming by, still 16 out front. On the fifth lap, they'll go eight before it's over. There's some history on this Salt Lake Circuit stage. We flash back to the 2017 Tour of Utah. It's downtown Salt Lake City, and Marco Conola timing his final move perfectly on the inside, leaves the competition in the dust, and they would not catch him as he crosses the finish line for the stage win in better health then than he is after the crash early in this tour. But Kristen Kenny caught up with him, talks about the travails of this year's Tour of Utah. All right, guys, well, this is it. The final sprinter stage at the Tour of Utah. And Marco, I know you won this one two years back. How do you see it playing out this time around? Yeah, we'll be, I think uh, it's enough if uh, we do the same, you know? <laughs> no, so we will try to, to keep the race uh, in, in the direction that we want. And uh, maybe we control the race or we put some guy in the front in the breakaway, but. Uh, they don't have to, to work uh, and then we will see also because I had a crash in the first stage here in Tour of Utah, uh, yeah, it's hard. Well, yeah. I was going to ask you about that because we can see that you're banged yeah. up from just day one here. I mean, how, how are you feeling now? Yeah, uh, I, you know, I came here and I feel really good, but now after the crash uh, I have so many pain and uh, I cannot sleep uh, really good also in the night, so that uh, hurts a lot. But uh, I try always to do my best uh, and uh, this is my job and I like it. Also, if sometimes we crash, <laughs> maybe I feel like more um, a warrior like that, no? <laughs> so uh, for me, it's like, a, uh, something special to try to win with the, with these injuries, and if I if I do it, then I'm more happy. I think. All right. Well, good luck fighting through those injuries today and channeling that inner warrior. Thank you very much. Bye. Wow. Thanks, Kristen. And what what an incredible guy. I mean, he looks in really beat up, and to even be thinking about trying to win today, that's amazing. This is the crash early. And took uh, Keel Reinen out. It was coming down the finish of one of the earlier stages, and he goes down hard, and you saw the remnants of that with the, uh, the beating his body took. He was able to continue. Reinen was not, however. Yeah, and he's covered in bandages. I mean, looking at his face, like, that was not a pretty scene there at all. Riding next to Joe Dombrowski at this point, number 61. 
and uh, he also has Fiorelli to see if uh, one of those two would be the fast guys on the team. But he said he came in feeling really good. But when you crash like that, it is hard to get your recovery. You don't sleep well. Every time you move, it wakes you up. Your rest is interrupted. And you have a lot of pain as well. Well, we're back out to the 16 rider front, the breakaway here with 23 and a half miles still to go. But these are the leaders, and they've got a distance of 45 a time of 45 seconds. So the peloton has closed a little bit. They have, and this is now down Virginia, where they really get up a high to a high level of speed. I think over 50 miles an hour every lap. So they continue. And stage four will roll on. We'll be back with live racing in just a moment. Welcome back, everybody. Stage four of the Tour of Utah rolls on. We're coming to you live from the Utah Sports Commission broadcast booth. And, well, they're well beyond halfway. And still, you've got that group out front trying to stay away. And the peloton just always lurking a little off the shoulder. It was 45 seconds was the margin a few min minutes ago. Uh, look for that to change significantly in the next couple of laps. Yeah, really. I mean, it feels like it's almost been like a brawl so far today. So much going on at the beginning <laughs> of the race. Finally, we got this group of 16 away Svetkov and McCabe then launching off of that so they could guarantee that he could get maximum points for the sprint jersey so a lot's been happening well we look at the profile you see where they are right now they've got the three to go and uh, the laps just continue to pile up eight of them when they started this thing they're gaining uh, 557 and a half feet per circuit in terms of elevation they'll go 53.8 miles with a time limit of 8%, which means that if you want to stay in this tour, you have to be within 8% of the total time of the winners today. And the way the peloton's going right now, not too many people look like they're going to get dropped. Yeah, it's, uh, it'll come apart like the last time up the climb, maybe, or the last two. But uh, certainly nobody looking like they'll be in jeopardy of being time cut unless they have some sort of a mechanical issue, something like that. Gap is 40 seconds. The leaders just made the turn under the Eagle Gate that you see there behind them heading up to the state capitol. That's Jimmy Whalen on the left for in the pink for EF Education First, right on the front there. The local, local hero, I would say. Uh, TJ Eisenhardt just pulling off to the left for the Arapahoe Hincapi team. This is Ulysses Castillo in the blue of Elevate KHS with the aero helmet on. Notice how he doesn't have much ventilation. And uh, there goes Howes in the King of the Mountains jersey, Jacopo, uh, and then we have Tony Baca for 303 Project out of Colorado. It's an all-star break and just a number of different countries represented there. You talked about it earlier, most of the teams represented as well. Sprint points coming up. Travis McCabe leads right now. He has 20 points in the sprint total. Lawson Craddock with 17, not a threat. Marengo has got 16, and then Hermans and Murphy round out the top five. And let's not forget, Marengo is in this group here. So look for the man in the yellow fluorescent colors to try to challenge McCabe this time. McCabe sitting uh, right now behind his teammate, Sergei Svetkov. Svetkov bringing him up. This is teamwork, people. This is how you do it. One rider helping his teammate, sacrificing his chances so that his teammate can make something special happen. Now, am I right? Is, is that the only uh, two individuals on the same team there? The worthy team for McCabe and Svetkov that are in that break? I think you're right. I, th I don't think anybody else has a teammate uh, in there except for him. Uh, Howes, that's right, EF Education first. Howes and Whalen in there as well. So once again, Svetkov doing the big work for McCabe, trying to keep him in great position, look back a little bit for Marengo, there he is. He's sitting about 10 wheels back, and he does not look like he is going for this intermediate sprint. Maybe he is saving everything for the finish of the race. You can see him right there behind TJ Eisenhart in front of that little split. But McKay will take the sprint points here. Well, he's got him. 
Once again, now he's got 25 points. He wants that jersey. Absolutely. I'm sure he's a little disappointed. You heard it in the interview earlier, if you were with us near the start of this one, where he talked about uh, missing so close, coming so close. He told us before the tour began that he wanted to add to that record of, of four, the most stage wins of anybody who's participated in the Tour of Utah. He has four and thought he could get at least one or two for this tour. So far, they have eluded him. Yeah, he had a chance in stage one, and then that late break got away. Lawson Craddock attacked. A few guys went with him. That was the stage that Marengo won. Everybody seemed to look around a little bit of who's going to chase. Craddock then took second on the stage and moved into the race leader's jersey. That was a day that really the sprinters, they, it was just pulled right out from underneath them. So they've just entered the sixth of the eight circuits. And there's the peloton with three left to go. You see in the upper left there that number three. That tells them how many more they have remaining. Hour and 14 minutes and 16 seconds and counting into this one. And this looks like Lawson, uh, excuse me, um, Lachlan Morton at the back of the field, maybe going back to the car. Kind of tricky to do on a stage like this when it's just going so hot. Each team only allowed one car, too, on this circuit because of the, obviously, the congestion with the riders. We'll step aside. More racing straight ahead. Stage four of the Tour of Utah. Combining the amenities of a major metropolitan area with the friendliness of a small western city, Salt Lake City is an ideal extended stopover and base camp to any Utah vacation. Enjoy hiking and biking in local canyons, which are just minutes from the city center. City Creek Canyon reaches back in the Uinta Wasatch Cache National Forest and the foothills of the Wasatch, where backyards are literally part of the expansive Bonneville Shoreline Trail, a network of road and mountain biking opportunities on the bench where the ancient lake's shore once rested. A compact downtown makes for easy walking, and there are many things to do in downtown Salt Lake. Visit the historical and spiritual heart of Utah, Temple Square. Take in a show. Few cities this size boast a professional opera, ballet, symphony, and theater. Or find a spot where local and touring bands are amping up the night. That look at Salt Lake City brought to you by the Utah Office of Tourism. Begin planning your next life elevated adventure at visitutah.com. Gap coming down now as the peloton continues to close in on this group of 16 riders. It's now 35 seconds. I think they had the gap up to almost two minutes at one point in time, but now it looks like maybe they're going to have to step things up up front and a little bit of a move here. It's 16 riders. A few of them decide to go with 28.9 kilometers remaining. Kevin Vermarka, the 18 year old on the Hoggins Berman action squad, making that attack out of the group there. And he is an incredibly good young rider. He won the under 23 version of Liege Baston Liege earlier this year. And that's like a lumpy, it's, it's known as a, one of the hilly classics in Europe. And it's a huge win for him. Trying to extend that margin that's down to 30 seconds now. And looks like a, uh, looks like still a, a decent gap, but you don't sense any real urgency yet with the Peloton. So they're feeling pretty comfortable the way they've brought it down. You know, Nippo Vini Fantini uh, doing a huge amount of work on the front. And we just got now, now down to 30 seconds. So once again, not a foregone conclusion that this breakaway is going to stay away. And, you know, that's, they're going to be bummed if they don't make it to the finish line because they had two minutes at one point and they have a good group. They have a lot of horsepower, but the field just steadily bringing them back. Well, they're going to be picking up some speed in a moment as TJ Eisenhart gets up off the saddle. Let's go out to uh, inside the tour with our man on the uh, moto chat. Hey guys, well, guess what? It's time to meet Virginia. I wanted to give you a perspective of what it's like on this descent. It is blistering. So what I've done is I've got my pilot here, Stewie, and what we're going to do is we've got the race behind us. These are the leaders, the 16 riders that are ahead of us. And what we're going to do is I'm going to step you through what the riders are going to be going through. Number one, what lane do they choose? Number two, 
where do they decide or if they decide to brake, what kind of speed they're using, number four, and more importantly, there's a tricky little devil in this thing. We like to call it in the world of professional cycling, road furniture. There is one median right in the middle where we are going our absolute fastest. Kids, it's like you're back on a roller coaster. Tick, 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 tick. Well, guess what? We are reaching the top and we are taking the right hand turn. I am gonna walk you through it right now and here we go. So, right now we're at about 65 kilometers an hour. And we're gonna, I'm gonna have Stewie speed up a little bit so we can see it. And right now we're up to 85 miles an hour, uh, kilometers an hour. We're just now passing the furniture, otherwise known as Hey Stewie, will you go fast forward so I can show the speed? So, about how fast. Now, this is where it gets really rough. Negotiate, bounce two. It's coming up here and this is the most chicane. And then right, and then we've got a big median right there with the bump. Now, as we come down, this is a tricky one right here. This one has almost tossed me off the bike three times. That one right there. Oh my goodness, that one. Now, the best part of it all is if we were in the back, cars would be diving us. You will listen. Listen to the bike bottom out. Oh, we were lucky on that one, but we will bottom out on this one. This is where the cars dive bomb us on the inside. Yep, one, two, back end slides out, and we're done. Back to you guys. I need to take a coffee break after that one. <laughs> wow. Hell, he survived, and that's why we pay him the big bucks right there. Right? His, his, I think Stewie is his best friend all week long, no question, as pilot. His very own roller coaster ride. Oh, that was fun. Well, you talked about the speed and, uh, and how they really have to be aware of it because of the technical nature. We've seen a couple of turns similar to this so far throughout the Tour of Utah. We had a mishap the other day, North Salt Lake stage, where we lost a couple of riders uh, where they went down. This is one of those, if you're not careful and not paying attention, that bike can just uh, slide out from underneath you. Well, and the riders have these incredibly narrow little tires and uh, they used to ride on 23 millimeter tires. Then they started riding on 25 millimeter tires, 25 millimeters wide. And so they just have a slightly bigger contact patch. It gives you a little bit of a greater sense of stability in the corners. One of the other things to worry about too, if you're a rider is, we talked about tar snakes, uh, the repairs on an asphalt road, but you've also got paint. And the yellow line, the center line, and then the white lines as well from the paint that's on the road can often cause you to lose some friction there and, and create the slide. So you have to be very careful. One of the reasons that, again, you preview a course, you find out where those bumps are that uh, Chad was talking to us about a few moments ago because the slightest little thing can be the difference between the end of a race going well for you and you maybe take that uh, stage win or you lose it towards the end. It's a, it's a one of those sports that obviously not only milliseconds but also millimeters can make the difference between success and failure. Yeah, and we now have Castillo going on the attack out of that break and trying to make something really special happen, but they've come back up to him. There's Avila on his wheel, rolling right by for the Israel Cycling Academy, looking under his shoulder there, and that must mean that there's nobody else on his wheel. Let's see what the gap is. Indeed, a little bit of indecisiveness from that group. Now two men have gone on the attack. Back to the front. EF Education first up there as well. And again, the team's riding on the front of the peloton, trying to figure out when to go, how much control they can exert. Yeah, Nippo Vini Fantini really not here riding for the general classification. They're here for stages, and they've got Conola and Fiorelli to sprint today. And Conola having that bad crash feeling pretty banged up. I'd be surprised and shocked if he could pull something off today, considering what he's been through. Coming down South Temple Street again. That's the Peloton. They'll be making that right-hand turn in just a few moments. And this is the start of the climb for the two riders that have just gotten away. Avila 
and Castillo. Notice how far behind they are in the general classification. 22 minutes and 57 seconds and 31.51. So within these, all these races going on, this is a race right now for stage glory. They have no impact on the general classification in the yellow jersey of Ben Hermans. This is about trying to win a stage. Winning a stage at this race, huge for any rider. Which means if you're the Israel Cycling Academy and you're riding for your your rider Ben Hermans, you don't worry too much about this because they're not going to have much of an impact on him, if any. And that's why the Nipovini Fantini team is on the front of the field chasing because they have two potential sprinters that can win from the field, but they can't win anything if there's 16 guys up the road. And we got one of the EF Education first men right at the front of the field. I wonder if he's thinking of attacking. It looked like Lachlan Morton. Castillo now still driving. Look at his helmet. See how his helmet is, has almost no ventilation. That's an aero helmet. And he, that means that he was expecting to be going on the attack today. When you're out front, you have that smoother helmet. It's less resistance. It's always a balancing act between ventilation and aerodynamics in the helmet. They will have two left when they come through the start finish line here in just a moment. There's no intermediate sprint this time. And now the question for me, well, we'll wait for the next lap to see if we can have the conversation about whether or not Travis McCabe sprints with one to go, because there are points with one lap to go. Again from the cable cam, following along with the riders. Not much of a gap for those two out front. There's Eisenhardt again in the gray kit with the uh, pin capping. So this group looking like it's losing a little bit of its mojo, the chasers, and they need to stay on the throttle or they're going to get swept up by the peloton in this whole day where they've been thinking about trying to win the stage is going to evaporate. Two laps remain. Six in the books. Salt Lake Circuit, stage four. The Larry H. Miller Tour of Utah for 2019, the 15th running, the 15th contesting of this tour. Wow, and look at how close the field is now. 22 seconds to the front of the group with two laps remaining. And more attrition at the back as they popped a few more riders off. Avila, one of those two men out front. Let's take a look at our media picks today and how we look. We've got some names that we've heard so far, others not so much. Frankie took Michael Rice, still looking to break the goose egg for Frankie, the former rider. Travis McCabe, that's your man, Gogo. -Go. You've got two points. Looks like you'll pick up a few more today. Chad has got Ty Magner. Almeida is there. Uh, he's my pick today. I've got 11 points. Uh, but Brad has got Avila, the man who is out front right now, and Brad leads the group with 13. So it looks like a pretty, uh, pretty heavy-duty pick for him, a well, well-researched pick, perhaps. For we'll, Brad. we'll see if he can make it all the way around. Avila on the front there, the 29-year-old Colombian riding for the Israel Cycling Academy, with Ulises, the Mexican rider who rides for that Elevate KHS squad. Two guys working together as a team, really, even though they're different, they're different teams because they got to try and hold off that chase behind them, which is coming up right now. Looks like, looks like Mosca bringing the group across behind the Trek Segafredo rider, and now it is back together at the front, but still only 20 seconds advantage on the peloton. These guys cannot afford to mess around at all. If they start looking at each other, the field's going to come right up to them. Eda Freire, DC Bank, putting in a little dig there. And the rest of the group kind of looking at each other. A lot of heads swiveling around. Travis McCabe following that move. There you get the area look. Uh, I believe they're just entering the green zone right now as well. 
Got a nice uh, bit of shade there. The green zone at the Tour of Utah this year presented by the Wildlife Generation committed to protecting wildlife and habitat through education and conservation. And speaking of the green zone, Wildlife Generation's Stephen Bassett was just at the front of that breakaway group as well. He's had a great year, won the Joe Martin stage race, won two stages. There he is on the front, Bassett flipping the elbow. Two stages at Joe Martin and the overall and second to Alex Howes at the U.S. National Championship road race in Knoxville just uh, about two months ago. A great season. One of the men who's in this move, and look at this, it looks like the field is really getting close now. 15 seconds. Got to be a little bit of consternation in that first group then. They know how close they're, they're getting, and you know, again, you've put a lot of work in, as you said, Todd, and can you hang on, can you maintain? part of cycling it's part of cycling and you have to get you have to somehow rally the rest of the group to make it cohesive to get a lot of people to ride if people start sitting on and becoming passengers and trying to save energy and not be in the wind it really disintegrates the chances of the break looks like you got an attack off the front of the peloton now somebody trying to bridge and Sergei Svetkov just swinging off the front of the group but you see how no one's pulling through Everybody's looking for someone else to do the work. This is the breakaway is not going to make it. Well, we're going to step aside, take this break. A moment ago, Chad Andrews showing us the cycling version of the roller coaster. The 2019 Larry H. Miller Tour of Utah has been brought to you by Zions Bank. For banking built to keep up with life, Zions Bank is for you. University of Utah Health, official medical provider of the Larry H. Miller Tour of Utah, and you. Snowbird, proud partner and host venue of the Tour of Utah. The Utah Sports Commission, Utah, the state of sport. And by the Larry H. Miller Group of Companies, more than 80 businesses united by one simple mission of enriching lives. A look at our postcard of the day presented by the Utah Office of Tourism, proud partner of the Tour of Utah, inviting you to experience the mighty five national parks and all the unforgettable landscapes and communities in between. Then come winter, the greatest snow on earth. Find inspiration and itineraries at visitutah.com. Live racing, and again, now we've got a little fracturing off the front of the group as well. Most guy, I believe, is the man who is out front from Trek Segafredo right now, and he's trying to put some distance between himself and the group. Yeah, the 25-year-old Italian, first year on Trek Segafredo. He's got three wins to his career, and he would like to make it four today, winning a couple of, uh, we won a stage and the overall at the Tour of Hainan in 2017. And then we also have Tour of China stage one victory. In that super tuck position and going down Virginia Street again. Quick look over his shoulder. Boy, he's got some separation right now, Todd. Now, so, it's a little bit deceptive distance-wise because they're moving so fast. From a time standpoint, it isn't all that much. But you look at the distance, and optically, it looks like a huge gap. Yeah, and I thought that was Mosca, but with the sun on the—there on the, he is. So Mosca, yeah, he uh, looks like he's in between now. We've got to see where he is in relation to the rest of the group. But they are, they've got one to go when they come through the finish at this point. So there's that hard right-hand turn. So it looks like Mosca is actually chasing the sole rider that's off the front. And it looks like it's, I'm wondering if that's Stephen Bassett who is off the front for wildlife generation. Or perhaps McCormick, he's out of the saddle now. We'll pick up that number as soon as we can for you. But the chase is 10 seconds behind, and then the peloton, only an additional five behind there. Hayden McCormick for bridge lane. I had never even seen him in the break yet, and he had now gone on the attack, pedaling in the super tuck. Very tricky. Notice his knees. They come up inside his handlebars between his hands 
and, his, and the end of his handlebars and the front of his bike. And if you blow that and you hit your knee, it's going to be a spectacular crash. Well, you have to worry about your toe down, too, in the pedals when they're coming off the front of the pedal like that. Look at the clearance between that right foot. Yeah, there's not a lot of space there. The deep dish wheels, all for aerodynamics. He is all in right now. He's picked up a few more seconds on the Peloton, and he now has 10 seconds advantage on the chasing riders. Mosca, Jacobo Mosca in between. Number 43 here, Zardini. this man, actually Zardini, attacked off the front of the field, tried to go up to the break, and it doesn't look like he's going to make it. So McCormick out front with that gap of 10 seconds. And 10 seconds behind the chase is the Peloton. Getting a little more serious, too, near the front of the Peloton. Yellow jersey wearer Ben Herman's there. He's got his Israel Cycling Academy team with him. And we'll see if Piccoli can do anything special the last lap of this race and try and get a few seconds back. He comes into the day. A little bit down at this point. He's uh, 44 seconds, so he's been going for it day in and day out, but he has ended up losing each of the last two days. A little bit of critical time to overall leader Ben Hermans. And there's McCormick, the New Zealand rider, riding on the Aussie team, Bridge Lane. Working hard. You saw him, as Todd pointed out a moment ago, in that super tuck position. Pedaling, we saw that last uh, on a consistent basis in the prologue up at Snowbird, all the way back to Monday when this event began. Seventh of eight circuits here for the leader. We'll take you all the way to the finish. You're watching live racing here on the fourth stage. Here comes. The right-hand turn heading north now, under the Eagle Gate, and up State Street. This is a look at the chase group from our helicopter. Still spread out, and still a large group here as well. Just 15 riders, 10 seconds behind McCormick, our leader. Now McCormick trying to turn this into an awesome result as they turn onto State Street, climb back up to the Capitol. They only have to do it two more times, but everything gets more intense at the end of the bike race. Cormick working hard. He looks really strong. He's down a long way in the general classification, so once again, no concern about the overall, he's nine minutes and 40 seconds down. Just hunting the stage. And stage hunting, it's a great thing to do. If you can't win the general classification, look for other opportunities. Look for stages, look for special jerseys, anything you can do to, to come home with something to be proud of. So McCormick out front right now. Got 20 seconds on the chase and 45 on the peloton. The 25 year old New Zealander riding on that bridge lane squad out of Australia. No professional wins to his credit. So this would immediately catapult to the best day he's ever had on the bike if he can pull this off. It looks like he's suffering pretty bad at the top of the climb. That's where it really starts to hurt. And he has one more of those to go through. One more and what's so hard Peloton now 45 seconds back, but the 15 riders 20 seconds behind. What's so hard is when you're in the wind all the way around to still have the punch that last time. That's what's hard to make happen. But obviously one of the keys is will that group work together, that chase group? It's a huge key. If they don't work together, McCormick could get this win. Very hard to stay away, though. Looks like somebody trying to get off the front of that chase group now as well. That's T.J. Eisenhart that is uh, trying to do that. But we're, meantime, looking at McCormick. Hearing the cheers of the fans here, that has to help you a little bit. Oh, it helps a ton. Sometimes it'll even give you goosebumps on your arms. I remember those days oh so well, just feeding off the energy of the crowd. The bell, one to go. He's got one lap to go. Oh, he thought he won. He's already He's won. Already won. won. Keep going. He thought he won. He still thinks he won. The crowd trying to let him know. No. 
We've seen this happen before. We talked about it. Now they're indicating no. to him off the moto. You've got one left. Oh, my. Remember we talked oh. about keeping track. Santos now coming across behind him. Oh, my. Oh, that's crazy. He... And he's not he's even blown. At this point, he knows he hasn't won, but he's not even going to try. Wow. Well, we've seen this drama un play, uh, unfold before and play out just like this. But you had to look at it when he raised his arms. But we go back to, uh, to Griffin Easter last year. Oh, and he just got passed by Santos. Oh, my. Oh. This is last year, Griffin Easter. The memorable moment. Watch this. He, he passes the finish line in Cedar City Stage 1. He thinks he's got it won, but the problem is one lap left to go. Oh, my. You have to feel so badly. Griffin Easter a year ago in Cedar City. Oh. And McCormick today here just moments ago, raising his arms in apparent triumph. And people trying to tell him, spectators, you've got one left. The motos, you've got one left. That's that's a clear indication of how chaotic the race is and how loud it is. Even though he's got the radio in his ear and his director there, it's so loud he can't hear anything and he doesn't know. So Johnny Clark off the front now with Santos and uh, Efren Santos, so two men and one lap to go. This is just crazy, I can't believe that that happened Actually, again this year. It's, it's Alec Cowan, I believe, the worthy oh. rider right there. It's Alec Cowan, the Canadian, along with number 92, and that's uh, Efren Santos. Absolutely, so they're out right. Front. Absolutely right. Cowan it is, Santos. So now two men. How crazy to have that happen to Hayden McCormick. Oh, my. <laughs> wow. Just what we spoke about earlier, when you've got the eight circuits so easy, if you're not paying attention, or as you said, if you can't get the race radio in your ear to tell you, and if, if you're by yourself, if you've got a teammate, then maybe it mitigates it a little bit, but when you're by, by yourself out there, no additional teammate to help. Wow. Yeah, such a shame. Such a shame. That's a day that he will not forget for the rest of his life. So he'll have to wait for his first professional victory. Let's go back out inside the race with Chad Andrews. Chad? Well, guys, the non-win win. We've all seen it before. We got a catbird seat. But what does that mean to the bike race? Well, unfortunately for him, it's not a win. But more unfortunate is that that moment of hesitation where the peloton, they actually say to themselves, wait a minute, was that it? And then they get word that that wasn't it. Then the smart riders like AKA Johnny Clark will take every advantage, every single momentary nanosecond to take advantage of that situation. How does he take advantage of it? The smart riders, the savvy riders, the one that have been around a long time, they go, hey, there's chaos. And what better way to win on a circuit like that in Salt Lake City is to take advantage of chaos. Back to you guys. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Well, we saw the chaos, no question about it. And right now, Alec Cowan is out there for Worthy. And number 92 is Efren Santos for Connells, Specialized, the Mexican team. And they are out front on what truly is the final lap. It's just so, it's so crazy that that can happen. But Cowan now with Santos as they get after it and see if they can make this lap stick that very small advantage at this point and the field with so much horsepower behind Cowan the 22 year old no big wins to his career making a bid for glory here in the final lap Santos the Mexican riding on that Connell squad He's 27 years old. He's been a national champion of Mexico. And look at the field. These guys are going to get mowed down. There's no way they can stay away. Yeah, Connell's rider just looked. Santos, he pulled off. It's just a matter of time before they get reeled in now. Oh. Two men standing. We had 16 riders off the front. They lost their cohesiveness. And now, with the efforts of Nipo Vini Fantini, the break is almost dissolved. Cowan continuing on. Santos saying, you know what? I know it's over. Go for it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, Santos has seen the inevitability of it. 
And now here they come. Two Italians, two Italian teams coming through. Now going on the counterattack as this thing is still wide open. Are we gonna get a field sprint? It looks like a good chance. It'll be strung out on the climb the last time, but they'll probably come into State Street as a group. So three riders off the front now, at least momentarily. Final lap here, Salt Lake Circuit. It's the fourth stage of the Tour of Utah here at 2018, 7.4K. Translating that into miles, well, now down to 7.3K, about a little over 4.3 miles, 4.5. Three men now trying to get away that just tiny little gap. And the third rider there looks like a, looks to me like a bridge lane rider. Pretty tough to see with that sun. Riders, again, still jockeying for position back in the peloton. They have not made That's... that push yet. Up front. Yeah, so we got the best young rider in there in the special jersey, Zhao Almeida, in there for Hoggins Berman action. So he's the man who came across. It's not Bridge Lane. And that's my man for the day. That's so your pick for the day. He's been in the top 10 in every one of the stages so far. So he's had a consistent week. Yeah, he's been incredible. Boy, just all kinds of attacking going on at this point. Get a look there, I believe. Is that TJ Eisenhardt from Hincapie up front? Now we're back to the lead group again. So we got Joao Almeida, best young rider, going on the attack. He's got one other man on his wheel from Nipovini Fantini. Almeida, if you look back at him, fourth in the prologue in Snowbird, second on stage one from the break. Seventh in stage 12, in stage two on Powder Mountain. Tenth yesterday in North Salt Lake. He's the under three, under 23 Portuguese road race and time trial national champion. Second overall at the Baby Giro, the Amateur Giro in 2018. And he also won in 2018 Liege Baston Liege for under 23 year olds. He is an incredible rider. We were talking about him yesterday, Steve. Just signed up for the Dasunic. Uh, quick step squad the number one ranked team in the world right now starting next year I thought maybe yesterday it might translate into a little extra effort from him but it looks like he saved it for today's stage and right now he's out front and they have a very small gap two riders trying to get across to him one of them is worthy pro cycling rider into the super talk ripping down the descent on Virginia Street. Is that Johnny Clark that's trying to bridge? Was that the worthy rider? I, d I didn't get a good look at it. Well, this is where they get the speed. And they'll make that hard right-hand turn at the bottom, and we'll see how well they navigate this, that little, little jog, the traffic island there. And still very tough, even though they've got this gap. It's so tenu tenuous. It's so hard to stay away because they're going to put out so much to stay in front as they come across West Temple, uh, South Temple, and then they got to turn right on state and make that climb. You've got to have freshness for that. And that's going to be the key. That has to be the key. How much do you have left coming up State Street the very last time? And then it's not a short shoot to get down to the finish. You've got to make the turn and still have some legs because there's a little bit of elevation before you get to the finish line then. It you does. see the distance, not much between those two groups of two. And we may end up with four riders together here momentarily. If they can really stay united, they have a chance, but it's going to be so tough to make it. And it looks like the front two, with a quick look around, they may want to see everybody bunch up here and if they can get those other two to work a little bit going up the hill. Looks like they are going to blend. So it's an Arapaho, Hincapi rider and a worthy pro cycling rider that are coming across. And now we've got four. They've got to stay vigilant here. They've got to just 
keep taking the big poles. If they start slacking off and thinking about how they're going to do the sprint, they're going to get sucked up. Here comes the peloton. This is always the drama. When you get a break like this and a finish like this, there's somebody else trying to bridge across as well. Now look at Almeida. This young man, awesome talent. Trying to get other guys to take a pull. Getting frustrated. Owen wants to step up. Now here comes the Incapi rider. Well, he's tucking in behind as well. Lots of game, lots of gamesmanship going on right now, and this is how breakaways get caught. And it's a look up the course as to what they have left. Break that turn. And then the final hill. It looks like Noah Granigan there for Worthy Pro Cycling. Noah picked up a nice win at Redlands in one of the stages earlier this year. Alida looking around as well. All of them now being concerned, obviously, at the gap between themselves and the peloton. Officially showing 25 seconds. Don't think it's quite that. We just haven't had a chance to retime it yet. Will they get sucked up? The odds say they probably will. Looks like it's actually Sergei Svetkov who has made it up there for Worthy Pro Cycling. He's been in the overall podium in this race before in the general classification. Now in the selection, Almeida back on the front and look at the field. It's coming right down to their back wheel. This is oh so common. The breakaway getting sucked up right as they hit State Street for the final time. It's make or break time right here. Who's got legs? Doesn't look like Almeida has it. And here they come. In Cappy on the front right now. All right, so looking back, look for McCabe, look for Ty Magner, look, at for, look for the sprinters. Conala, Fiorelli. As these guys trying to hold on from the break, but this is an impossible thing. You saw a rider at the back of the field there just pulling off to the side, blowing up. And our breakaway, trying to hang on. There's no way. This is a very steep climb. And when those guys start sprinting from the field, they're going to have a lot more pop than the man off the front. There's James Piccoli. Piccoli is second overall. He's got Travis McCabe on his wheel. Piccoli going big. He is going big, trying to get some time on Hermans. Piccoli, then McCabe. Lawson Craddock sitting in fourth. He sits in second place in the sprint competition. He's had two second places in the race so far. It is on right here in the final 500 meters. Got to favor McCabe if it's a drag race between this group right here. One of the fastest men in the field. You got to favor McCabe, but you got to give it to Piccoli. He does not give up for the general classification. 300 meters to go. McCabe looking back. There's Tra Craddock sitting in fourth once again. Where does McCabe make his move? Oh, here's the move right now. And that's Alarcon for Connells. Alarcon trying to take it away from McCabe. And it's also Connella. Connella coming up on the left side of your screen. The man who crashed two days ago. Does he get it? Does Marco Connella get it? He does. What After the crash, he gets the win. What a finish. The man who said he wanted it today in the worst way, but he was hurting so badly. He said if he could win today, he would feel like a gladiator. Check that box. Unbelievable. Look at him bandaged up, his face covered in road rash. He gets the win. Wow. Pain personified, but Mark O'Connell has the stage win today. Who would have thought he could have outraced Travis McCabe in a sprint? He can't even hardly believe it. Wow.
That move when it came from Kamala came so quickly. This is what he did a few years ago when he came in. These are unofficial right now, but McCabe finishing second. Rim in third, Alarcon fourth. So watch this. Connell, look at the distance he makes up here. Yeah, Alarcon leading it out. Connell, I thought McCabe was just going to blow around him. McCabe struggled a little bit. Connell looking great for a guy who hit the deck so hard a few days ago. McCabe second, rim up into third. Well, that's courage. Mark O'Connell told us how he felt earlier. And there it is, enjoying the moment, at least for the moment. And then the pain sets in. The 30-year-old Italian, his ninth professional victory of his career. That was impressive. His last win a couple of years ago, back in 2017, winning the stage here, also winning the Japan Cup. That's huge. <laughs> Celebrating with his Vini Fantini team. Those guys chased the break all day. Conola delivered. That's huge. So Marco Conola unofficially wins the stage. Back with more in Salt Lake. Ben Hermans continues to wear yellow unofficially in the general classification. No change really there. Piccoli comes in at 44 seconds. Eck is third. Murphy and Stetton around out the top five. That's still unofficial. And then six through ten. Former winner Joe Dombrowski. Almeida comes in. He's at 248. Craddock, Britton, and Badalati will round out the top ten in the GC. But what can you say about Mark O'Connell today? That winning ride. He just, just absolutely turns on the afterburners. He following McCabe, he knew right where he wanted to be. And then he said, you know what? I think I got better legs than you. Around the right side, then moving over to the left just because of the contours of the road. Clean set of wheels there, not even close. A fully ahead of Travis McCabe. McCabe didn't even have the power to get next to him by the finish. That was impressive. Mark O'Connell bandaged, bloodied, but not beaten today. Yeah, that's that's one he's going to remember for a long time. That's a beautiful win. Stage wins, obviously important. His second one, though, in the Tour of Utah. But you're right. He absolutely will remember this one. Connell beating McCabe. I mean, that in and of itself, when you come down the straightaway, you are behind a Travis McCabe, sat on the wheel, and are able to outhaul him. That is something that does not happen very often, Travis McCabe getting beaten from behind. Completely agree. And notice him once again pointing out his team, Vianney Fantini. Those guys rode on the front the whole day to bring that break back, and then he delivered at the end. Well, Pretty awesome. Great stage here, and of course the drama has been there before for Conala and today uh, more so than last time, because last time when he made his move, uh, he rode away from it. This one, he got the win in the most improbable, perhaps, way, and there's a couple of competitors comparing notes right now, McCabe and Conala. Yeah, well, love, love the fact that first and second, you know, once the race is over, they're all friends. As the sun sets over the Great Salt Lake and over a terrific stage four tonight here, the Salt Lake Circuit, eight laps, and it was decided in the last 50 or 20 meters as that man in orange on the left gets the stage win. Well, he's going to feel it tonight. There's no question about that, but it will hurt a lot less when he gets into bed this evening with a win. For Chad Andrews, Chris Kenny, and Todd Gogolski, I'm Steve Brown. That wraps up stage four of this year's Tour of Utah. The winner, Mark O'Connell. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for stage five coverage beginning 7 p.m. Eastern. And for all the latest updates and news, be sure to check out tourofutah.com. This has been a presentation of Utah Cycling Partnership, Inc. And we'll see you tomorrow for stage five of the 2019 Larry H. Miller Tour of Utah.